Welcome back to the deep dive. So if you've been watching the AI arms race, you know there's one name that's just seemingly untouchable, NVIDIA. Oh, absolutely. Trillion dollar market cap. Trillions, right. And everyone immediately points to the silicon, the H100s, the new Blackwell chips. But today we're going to talk about something uh, much more strategic than the metal. We're talking about the software lock-in the thing that actually makes all that hardware indispensable. Exactly. The foundation of NVIDIA's dominance isn't really the chip, it's the software moat they built around it. We're talking about CUD. Compute Unified Device Architecture. It started way, way back in 2006. And it wasn't just a set of tools. It created this massive network effect that for a long time made high-performance AI basically impossible outside of their world. It's their real $3 trillion moat. It is. So if the lock-in is software, the attack has to be software too. And that's our mission for this deep dive, to really break down the structural shift that's threatening this entire empire. Yeah, we're talking about the power pairing of JAX, that's Google's functional programming framework, and XLA, the Accelerated Linear Algebra Compiler. And the core idea here, the thesis, is this profound flip in architecture. C-Day depends on human experts, you know, specialists, hand-tuning code for every last drop of performance on an NVIDIA chip. Right, but JAX and XLA, they take that entire optimization job away from the human and give it to the machine, uh, or the compiler. And if the compiler can optimize that code for any hardware... Then the hardware layer suddenly becomes a commodity. And that is the mechanism that lets the big hyperscalers finally start to bypass what you could call the NVIDIA tax. Let's get into it. Okay, let's start by defining what the CUDA moat actually looks like. It's not just one wall, is it? Our sources describe it as more of a defensive structure with three distinct layers. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. The foundation layer one is the kernel library. Right. These are literally thousands of pre-written hand-optimized subroutines. Mm -hmm. You know, things like Kubaloos for matrix math, KDNN for neural networks. They are tuned to exploit every single microscopic detail of NVIDIA's silicon. And a perfect example of this in action is something like Flash Attention 3. Flash Attention is the perfect example of the kernel trap. It's this brilliant algorithm for making transformer models run faster by managing memory better. But the newest versions, they are specifically designed to use highly specialized instructions. Instructions that only exist on NVIDIA's latest hopper chips. Exactly. Things like WGMMA, TMA, FP8. So if you're a competitor, say AMD or AWS with their Tranium chip, you can't just run it. You have to spend months, literally months, mm -hmm. reverse engineering it and building your own version from the ground up. So it's a guaranteed performance lead for NVIDIA, not because of the silicon, but because of the software. It's a lock-in. It yeah. forces everyone else into a constant game of catch-up. Okay, so that's layer one. Layer two is the tooling ecosystem. Hmm, the tooling. This is about visibility. If your big training run is slow, NVIDIA gives you tools like Intite Systems. It lets you see, cycle by cycle, exactly what the chip is doing. And that kind of debugging, I mean, that's critical. And it's something competitors like AMD's ROCM have really struggled to replicate. It's a massive point of friction. If you're a developer and your code fails on a competitor's chip, you're basically working blind. Which brings us to the third layer, and maybe the most powerful one the talent pool. The human element. We have an entire generation of ML engineers who are trained to think in CUD terms. Their first instinct for a new idea is, okay, I need to write a custom CDA kernel to make this fast. That mental model just perpetuates the whole dependency. Yeah. This total reliance on manual kernel-centric work, that's also its biggest vulnerability. It is. The memory wall. Can you break that down with an analogy for us? Sure. Think of it like a restaurant. The framework, like PyTorch, is the customer. In the CDD world, the customer orders each part of the meal one by one. I need a dot product. The chef, that's the GPU core, goes to the pantry, which is the HBM memory, gets the ingredients, cooks it, and puts the finished dish back in the pantry. Then the customer says, okay, now I need a re-LU activation. And the chef has to go all the way back to the pantry, get the first dish, do the next step, and put it back again. Exactly. All that back and forth between the kitchen and the pantry is where you lose all your time. Modern AI is almost always limited by memory bandwidth, not raw compute. That constant data shuttling just kills performance. It kills it. And as models get more complex, mixture of experts, state space models, this manual human-led optimization process just can't keep up. And that is where JAX comes in. The structural answer. The structural answer. People often hear JAX and think, oh, it's just NumPy for GPUs. But it's so much more than that. It's a philosophical shift. It really is. It moves you from imperative programming, that stateful restaurant analogy we just used, to functional programming. 
where your whole model is just a pure stateless function. Okay, so why is being stateless so important? Why does that concept scare a company like NVIDIA when we're talking about a $100 billion training run? Because statelessness makes your code trivially parallelizable. I mean, just incredibly easy to scale across a massive cluster. How so? Well, if a function doesn't rely on or modify any external state, you can just send that same function to 4,000 chips at once, feed them all different data, and you just collect the results. There are minimal synchronization headaches. You get rid of the nightmare of trying to manage some huge global stateful object across thousands of machines. That's the huge structural advantage. So let's get into the actual tools JX provides to do this. The first pillar is GRAD, Automatic Differentiation. This is the engine of machine learning. And JAX's version is powerful because it can handle native Python stuff loops, recursion, which is critical for cutting edge research. And the really critical bridge to this new world is JIT, just-in-time compilation. JIT is the magic. It's the mechanism that takes your pure JAX function, rips it out of the slow Python interpreter, and it hands the entire block of code over to the XLA compiler. So XLA gets to see the whole program at once. The entire computation graph. And that lets it fuse operations together. We're moving from our order-by-order order restaurant to a massive prefix tasting menu that's cooked all at once. My favorite, I think, for just raw developer productivity is VMAP. Oh, VMAP is brilliant. You just write your code as if you're only processing a single image or a single token of text. And then the VMAP transformation automatically handles all the batching for you. It pushes that batch dimension down into all the math. It's, it's automatic scaling. And finally, the features for true supercomputing, post-GPU scale, time map, and shard map. Right. This is what enables SPMD, or single program multiple data parallelism. Instead of being stuck thinking about one GPU, shard map lets a researcher explicitly tell the system how to split a giant tensor, say, a huge weight matrix across a logical grid of devices. You can control everything. So there's a clear developer paradox here. It's a steep learning curve. You have to unlearn all your old stateful habits. For sure. But the payoff is what's being called research velocity at scale. The code you write for your laptop is basically the same code you use on a 4,000 chip TPU pod. And it's no surprise that the big players, Google DeepMind, Anthropic, and crucially, Apple, mm. are all using this stack for their most important new models. So if JAX is providing these perfectly clean, stateless instructions, XLA is the engine room that turns them into optimized machine code, finally breaking that CUDA dependency. That's right. And XLA's superpower is whole program optimization. What does that mean in practice? Where an old imperative model sees 10 separate operations, XLA sees one single unified graph. And its main job is something called kernel fusion. Okay. It looks at a sequence of operations, say a matrix multiply, then adding a bias, then a GELU activation. And instead of running three separate CEDA kernels, it generates one single custom kernel for that whole sequence. Wait, hold on. A single custom kernel. Does that really make up for the efficiency of a raw, hand-tuned CUDA kernel written by a specialist? It absolutely can. Think about the memory wall again. XLA makes sure that the system reads the data from the big, slow HBM memory once, does all 10 operations inside the lightning fast on-chip registers, and then writes the final result back just once. You're cutting down latency. Dramatically. You boost your arithmetic intensity, and on top of that, XLA has intelligent buffer analysis that reuses memory, letting you fit bigger models onto the same hardware. But the real strategic move here isn't just the optimization, it's the portability. And that's achieved through something called Sable HLO. What is that? Stable HLO is the universal Rosetta Stone for AI. When JX sends its graph to XLA, XLA converts it into stable HLO. It's just a defined vocabulary that describes what math needs to be done, dot product, convolution, without specifying how the hardware should actually do it. So it completely decouples the AI model from the physical hardware layer. Exactly. Once you have that stable HLO graph, the XLA backend can compile it for any target. A Google TPU, an AWS Trainium chip, an AMD GPU, or even an NVIDIA GPU using standard compilers. This is it. This is the technical mechanism that neutralizes the CUDA lock-in. It turns the AI hardware market into a commodity race based on pure FLPS per dollar. Now, we do have to mention the limits. XLA is brilliant with static shapes, you know, fixed batch sizes, fixed sequence lengths, which is common in LLM training. Right, but it can struggle with dynamic shapes. Like during inference, when you're generating text of different lengths, if the shape changes, XLA often has to recompile the entire graph, which adds a lot of overhead. 
So developers sometimes have to pad data with useless zeros just to keep the shapes the same. Yeah, you introduce a little bit of waste to avoid that recompilation penalty. It's a trade-off. Now, while XLA can run on NVIDIA hardware, it really finds its true potential with its co-design partner, Google's custom silicon, the TPUs. This is where the whole compiler model really sings. It really does. The secret sauce inside a TPU is the matrix multiply unit, or MXU, which uses something called a systolic array. Okay, so forget the GPU for a second, which is like a general purpose workshop. What's a systolic array? A systolic array is a specialized, perfectly synchronized assembly line built for one thing and one thing only, matrix multiplication. How is it different from a GPU core? Well, in a GPU, data is always moving in and out of registers. In a systolic array, data flows rhythmically through the processing units, kind of like blood through a heart. You load the key weights, and they stay put, constantly being reused. It sounds incredibly rigid. It is, almost impossible to program by hand, which is why XLA is so essential. XLA manages the precise timing, the data layout, everything. It even handles things like automatically padding your tensors with zeros to perfectly fit the TPU's native 128 by 128 block size, so not a single cycle is wasted. And beyond the chip itself, Google has this other moat, a networking moat. They use optical circuit switching, their Jupiter fabrics. Yeah, and this is so often overlooked. This OCS technology lets Google dynamically reconfigure the entire supercomputer topology on the fly. They can connect up to, what, nearly 9,000 chips into one single coherent unit. And that massive bandwidth is what lets distributed JX training run so flawlessly at scale. It is. Okay, so let's get to the bottom line for the people actually cutting the billion dollar checks. The TCO, the total cost of ownership, the Google discount. This is the whole point, right? An NVIDIA H100 can cost you upwards of $25,000 because of margins and scarcity. But Google's internal cost for their TPUs is estimated to be four to six times lower than the market rate for equivalent NVIDIA compute. Because they capture that margin themselves. Exactly. And even external customers see this. They often report two to four times better performance per dollar running JX on TPUs. Just look at a model like Llama 3. The hardware cost for training that on H100s was estimated at around $720 million. Imagine cutting that cost by a factor of two or three. That's a colossal competitive advantage for Google internally. So this hyperscaler revolt is real. It's happening. I mean, look at Apple, a company famous for vertical integration, and they chose to train their critical MM1 models using JAX on Google TPUs. That is a massive endorsement. It's them saying, we are actively bypassing the NVIDIA ecosystem for our next-gen workloads. And then you have Anthropic. They're the ultimate example of hardware agnosticism. Totally. They deploy their Claude models across AWS Trainium, Google TPUs, and NVIDIA GPUs, and they maintain what they call strict equivalent standards. That's the commodity thesis made real. It is. And this whole front is being solidified by the OpenXLA project. AWS has adopted XLA for their Neuron SDK, which powers their Trainium chips. They're all banding together to create a robust, shared, non-NVIDIA compiler ecosystem. So let's tie this all back to market valuation. What does this compiler-led revolt mean for NVIDIA's legendary margins? Well, if JX and XLA help shift, say, 30 to 50% of the most valuable training workloads onto cheaper custom silicon in the next few years, NVIDIA's pricing power has to erode. Their gross margins right now, they're around 75%. That's software level. It's a monopoly margin. That number will almost certainly compress back toward a more normal hardware margin, maybe right. 50 or 60%. That's a huge potential loss in shareholder value. And on the flip side, for Alphabet, this vertical integration is a powerful hedge. They don't pay the NVIDIA tax. Not at all. Their CapEx dollar just buys more compute. We estimated 30 to 50% lower TCO because they own the whole stack. Mm. This self-reliance justifies a real structural valuation premium. It's an incredible position to be in. They're long AI and structurally short the high margin hardware providers. Okay, let's bring this deep dive to a close. The big takeaway is that we are definitively moving from the era of the kernel writer, that human CDA expert, to the era of the model compiler. That's the perfect synthesis. Yeah. Now, NVIDIA is responding. They're moving up the stack with higher level software like CDAX. And they're really emphasizing networking and Finiband and VLink as their next layer of lock-in. They'll still be dominant for a lot of things like prototyping and enterprise. For sure. 
But the provocative thought I want to leave with you, the listener, is this. Is CUDA on the same trajectory as the by 86 architecture? You know, still dominant for legacy systems, for consumer products, but fundamentally losing the war for the highest end, massive scale training market to compiler led custom silicon. Keep your eyes on two things. First, the maturity of the open XLA project. And second, how seamlessly the PyTorch ecosystem, specifically torch.compile, can target OpenXLA as a backend. Because when hardware agnosticism becomes the path of least resistance for the majority of developers, the moat will have finally dried up.